Hello, good people of the internet. Welcome to Let's Listen. My name is Josh, and tonight here I am joined by five of the seven members of the game Brass. Going around, we've got John, Robert Matz, we've got Robbie Duguay, we've got Thomas Kresge, and Daniel Romberger. How are you gents all doing tonight? Hey, uh, reasonable. doing well. Very good. good. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Right on. Well, just uh, just getting the formalities and the biographical material out of the way, why don't we do a little bit of a round robin here and, and introduce ourselves and our role in the game, Brass, starting with you, John. Sure. Uh, hi. My name, uh, as was mentioned, uh, I am John Robert Metz. I am a uh, trumpet player. I play mostly first trumpet, but sometimes piccolo trumpet and bass trumpet and other trumpety things. Occasionally I sing, uh, occasionally I write arrangements, and when I'm not playing with these guys, I'm a full-time professional composer for video games. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, recent works include the Tachia soundtrack, which is amazing. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Tachia was a blast. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. And uh, and working down the line here, we've got Robbie Duguay. Robbie, how are you doing? Tell us a little bit about your role in the Game Brass. Hey, yeah, I'm Robbie. Uh, I play the second trumpet in the band. Um, I am less than half of the trumpet player that John Robert is, but the guys still let me play with them. So, uh, no, I'm just joking. Um, yeah, I, uh, I too am a composer for my real life job, but it's, uh, it's more fun to, to be in a nerd band. So, um, <laughs> uh, Daniel and, and I were sitting in a hallway at Magfest like seven years ago or something. And we were like, we should start a band. And now we have a band. So happy to be here. That's wow. how it got started. That's the whole yeah. story right there. <laughs> Two Pretty sentences. Much. I love it. Oh, man. Uh, and then also we have Thomas. Thomas, uh, yeah, tell us about uh, your spot in the game, Brass. Uh, hi, I'm Thomas Kresge. Um, I, I do all the things that nobody else wants to do. <laughs> um, uh, mostly uh, producing the band, mixing all the music, doing a decent amount of arrangements now and then. Uh, not so much lately, but not as much as Daniel. Um, at least not on this and, and otherwise uh yeah yeah task mastering task mastering <laughs> wow <laughs> Wait, you got the you got some brass in the back there but i don't see your whip uh maybe that'll come out a little bit later as things loosen up to the sound design aspect of things you know sometimes you just gotta just, just and just really like lean into things i don't know it's stupid Every band needs one, though, honestly. Uh, and Daniel, also, man, uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about your spot on Game Brass. Hello, I'm Daniel, Danny Rom, Daniel, Danny Music, Romberger. There we go, <laughs> trying to get it all together. Uh, I play trombone in the ensemble, and for this album in particular, I also did a lot of arranging. I, we found out exactly half, eight out of the 16 tracks were arranged by me. Um, and then in addition, uh, Robbie and Thomas didn't mention it, but, uh, the three of us have kind of been the ones that handle the game rest videos. Usually I do the initial edit and then send it to either Robbie or Thomas to do some fun things and shenanigans with. Uh, so if you like the game rest videos on the YouTube channel, it's, a uh, become quite a team effort as of late. Oh man, they are an yeah. absolute delight. Lots of fun editing and and concepts there. I'm just gonna make sure that I've got your channel handy here to drop in chat for all the good people at home who should be going over and smashing that subscribe button and ringing that <laughs> ding along ding along ding dong bell. Um, yeah, uh, we're all about promotion here. Uh, of course, uh, you might have noticed I am sitting in front of the Louvre here in Paris, France itself. Um, uh, because we're going to be witness to a gallery of wonderful video game arrangements by the Game Brass. We are here to celebrate their release of the Brass Indie Expo, uh, which is a, a colorful collage and collection of different indie titles lovingly arranged by the folks that you see in front of you here today. Um, yeah, uh, anybody who wants to pick this one up, maybe pass it around a little bit, but, uh, but where did this idea for the Brass Indie Expo come from? Well, so, uh, I'll, I'll start off by saying we're, we're actually, we have more members of the band who couldn't be here tonight. I want to give them shout outs. Uh, first is John Stacy, who plays French horn or just horn. He'll introduce himself and say, I'm the horn. Texas horn. Uh, 
Sorry. Yeah, he's uh, he's not feeling well tonight. And uh, also we have Alex Hill who plays the tuba and wasn't able to join us. Um, but yeah, the Brass Indie Expo, uh, we normally name our albums after like a pun. Like we'll make some off like like offhand joke in a stream or a chat or a meeting or something. And someone's like, haha, yeah, Brass Effect. Let's called brass effect it'll be all and then we do and then we do yeah or yeah. brasylvania yeah. we're gonna do an album that's just all spooky music from spooky games of course um exactly and so they all start from this terrible pun but we knew we wanted to do an indie game album you know and and this is the real trick yeah it was like what do you yeah and so daniel it? you were one of the pushing main forces behind going for indies as the theme of the next album. Yeah. Um, I really and we were all like, yeah, we can get on board with that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but we didn't have a good one. Right. So and I thought, I thought it was meetings. important. I thought it was important with this one, especially because it is music from indie games to make sure that the message is communicated very clearly that this is um, about music from indie games and a big reason that I wanted to push for it in particular is that the Game Brass covers a lot of classic tracks, um, tracks that have had the benefit of like 10, 15 years of the games have been famous for that long. Um, yeah. So this was our opportunity to one, do a lot of music that's newer and two, do a lot of music that's by people who in some cases we know uh, in some cases, extremely we know well. Personally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we focused on like, you know, these these smaller games that were nonetheless fantastic and had fantastic music and went through. How many weeks was it that we just struggled to find a name for this thing? Easily. It took, like, it took quite a long time. Um, and then our yeah. initial vision for it was something of an expo where you're walking around from game to game or uh, how the theming for the artwork ended up being more of a museum where you go from exhibit to exhibit. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what we finally like caught on to. It's like we wanted it to feel like these were important. Like every game on this list was important and had important music that we wanted to highlight. And like, we struggled with things like, uh, you know, the brass Indies or things like that. And like, none of these things seemed quite right. And then we realized that like, like we went something that was less punny. It's not a joke, which is surprising for us, but it's, it's, it's less punny. It's maybe a little bit more sophisticated, even if we're kind of putting on a little bit of like comical airs in our sophistication. Uh, and, you know, and went for something that was uh, intentionally a little bit more heightened, a little bit classier. And with this museum motif, uh, you know, the the idea of the title uh, came, you know, started to form. And then on top of that, we had fantastic art to complete the picture. And I'm going to pass that ball over. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, talk. I was going to say. At the same time that we came up with the album title was right around the time we got Emma to start on the art. So uh, Emma, Emma Ember, Ember, yeah, you can see on the screen now, uh, Emma Ember, who did our album art for Horns of Hyrule, uh, also did this art. And so we were talking to her about like, what if it's like a museum and you can sort of see the different images of the different games around you? And she came up with this awesome uh, this awesome work, which she actually 3D modeled this and then painted over it, uh, which is, I think, fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's really beautiful, and there's definitely been a lot of love put into there representing all the different tracks that you guys have on this album. Um, yeah, I'm just going to ask uh, someone to get me a link to an Instagram or something, because, uh, uh, yeah, definitely want to support more real non-artificial artists in this day and age. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, definitely. Oh my God. Uh, well, we do have a lot of tracks. You guys have 16 lovingly prepared arrangements on this album. Um, and I know we're going to have a lot to talk about coming on through the rest of the show. So I am curious, are you fellows ready to dig into our first couple of tracks here? Let's do it. Let's do it. Awesome. All right. Well, we are going to be listening to Short Flight, which is a, a cover from A Short Hike. Uh, I haven't played that one personally. There's a lot on this, actually. I'm just going to out myself that I haven't that I haven't <laughs> played. So I'm hoping that that you five, uh, or sorry, you four all do. Um, to, I'd love to hear what these all all these games mean to you. Um, and then we have uh, A Hat in Time, 
arrangement as well. Uh, so a short flight before we dig in here. Uh, what do you guys want to tell me about this one? We've got Daniel as a ranger and uh, and originally composed by Mark Sparling. Uh, Daniel, do you want to kick us off on this arrangement then? Sure. So I can first say that we know Mark personally. Uh, Robbie and Mark are colleagues, and we actually collaborated with him already on a uh, cover of Tal Tal Heights that Thomas arranged for Brass Quintet plus Game Boy. So um, with this uh, game, a short, a short hike, it's recently coming out on uh, Switch. Uh, I, I, I don't know what to say about it other than it's a very like peaceful, charming, story-driven game. Um, this particular track appears at a very pivotal moment in that game, and uh, it has a bit of a weighty, floaty feeling, kind of. Uh, John Robert called it a Studio Ghibli track, <laughs> and uh, I think that's a very kind comparison. <laughs> Wasn't explicitly what I was thinking of at the time, but I could see the resemblances. <laughs> Nice. And then, Thomas, for your arrangement of The Hat in Time, um, yeah, anything that you want to say to preface us before uh, before we listen to it? You can say no. That's okay, too. Yeah, I don't want to admit that I've never played the game. So, um, <laughs> But did listen to the music and thought this should be arranged. Um, but I should credit the percussionist that will be on that track and who are on a lot of this album, uh, Doug Perry and Raul Venomali. Oh, will nice. first show up on uh, The Hat in Time. Right on, yeah. No, definitely love those, love those two gents. All right, folks, well, then let's dig in with our first listen here on Let's Listen. <laughs> Thank you. 
god well we're just having a hoot and a holler backstage uh that was a wonderful wonderful first listen here uh well of course not the first first listen because this album has actually been out uh for a little while now uh it's on Bandcamp, folks the, the link is in chat there uh so definitely head on over and get it uh unless you know you just want to stick around and, and actually listen to it on here that's a good idea too but release september 1st um yeah it's it's been really charming so far lots of love in these arrangements and these performances um yeah uh so thomas we're gonna try and milk you for a, a few more comments about a hat in time um yeah what what does this game mean to you if you haven't played it <laughs> why 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 did you want to do this song if you had like no frame of reference for it at all um we start with we actually started with a log list of uh of tracks there's a lot of uh you know what what what, what are all the indie games and which one of them has music and all the indie games every single what is it? Arrange <laughs> music Wikipedia of indie indie games yeah <laughs> just yeah, every so- just look at um, look at Steam. Twenty games released today. And, and yeah, I mean, I will admit, a lot, and there's a number of arrangements I've done that I've never played the game, but I've heard the music, and decided this would be good for this case, for this ensemble, for this album. Um, I actually had a bit of a hard time with this arrangement because the original track is like almost seven minutes long, um, so a bit of cutting down on that, and then trying to kind of figure out how to make it stand out a little bit more. Um, and so to do that, I literally did copy some um, uh, some material from Back to the Future, <laughs> um, hearing a similar kind of melodic relationship between them. So that's kind of where I had I had a bit of a, a light bulb moment and finally finished things up with something I was happy with on that. 
Absolutely beautiful. Um, and there are some of these. Oh, no, sorry. I thought there was a video for this one on YouTube as well. Uh, there's day. a video. There's a video for a short flight. A short flight. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, well, then maybe uh, since we didn't feature it, uh, Danny, do you want to just give us a little, bit, <laughs> a little, <laughs> little insight onto uh, onto a short flight in terms of the video production and stuff? Ooh, the video production. Yeah, um, come on. I, I love. I believe I love video. I believe Robbie has more to say about that. Actually. <laughs> okay. Oh, Robbie, uh, we're, we're, he doesn't have that. anything to say while he's muted, though. No, no, no. We're, he's <laughs> I, doing the gestures. I'm trying to be pretty good <laughs> about the button, but uh, because we know Mark and Adam, who who made the game, uh, I actually emailed him. As I sent him the recording and said, "Hey, like, what do you think of this?" First of all, and and secondly, can you get me some kind of a hack to uh, record some good sections of the game? Because the camera is very fixed and like a, a high angle. It's 3D, but it's sort of like a uh, what's the word? The isometric view. Isometric view. Thank you. Um, much like that for the, for the whole game. Um, but yeah, so he he sent me like a bunch of cheat codes and let me break the camera, and then I was able to record spots that were like key to what I thought was good for appreciating the game. And then um, the actual piece of music is the last one you hear in the game as you finish the game. Um, and so it was a cool thing to like. The, the whole game is the process of climbing this mountain. And so seeing different places from around the mountain as parts of the background and then being able to sort of show the main character in flight and stuff is just uh, it's really nice to sort of be nostalgic for this game that was just so beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Well, folks, the link is in chat there. Please go watch this video. Uh, the Game Brass do not, they do not uh, c take shortcuts, that's for sure, when making these videos. They're a real <laughs> we only take short hikes. Sorry, wait, uh, no, no, we, that was we great. We take as many shortcuts as possible, and then we just try hard anyway. It's the worst plan. Yeah, yeah we're always like, well, here's a really well, easy thing we, we could take, do. We and take then... the shortcuts so we can try hard on the things that we care about. That's true. There you but go. The problem is we care about everything. So anyway, <laughs> there will be videos for all of these eventually. But for now, Probably. We've, uh, we've got a couple. <laughs> awesome. Definitely go check them out on the YouTube channel there, folks. Um, well, yeah, I mean, we were talking backstage a little bit about... Um, about the fact that you are all geographically separate from each other. Um, doing gigs is hard, but obviously, you know, especially being a brass ensemble, uh, doing recording is also a challenge because um, typically in classical ensembles, you're used to occupying the same room, hearing each other playing, responding to each other in real time, and, and not necessarily adhering to that hard BPM you know, those strict tempo maps and stuff like that. Uh, so I wanted to maybe get a little bit of insight into what your production process is like, your recording process, if somebody just starts laying things down or if you kind of piece it together as you go. Mind if I take this one? Uh, so basically our process uh, begins with the arrangement. Uh, once we, you know, whoever is being, uh, whoever's the lead arranger on a project, sometimes we collaborate, but most of the time it's one person taking the lead, uh, sits down, chooses the piece, writes the arrangement for the people that they want to feature. Uh, one thing we haven't really mentioned on this is uh, while we are a quintet for almost everything, we tend to augment ourselves slightly with some friends. Uh, we have a couple percussionists on this as well. Uh, Doug Perry and uh, Rahul Vanamelli uh, feature prominently in a bunch of these tracks, but we'll figure out what we want to feature, what we want to do, and begin writing the arrangement. Uh, from there, we will you know, write the arrangement in score, usually, create a good-looking score. Thomas is our resident engraving expert. He does that professionally, so he will do a nice pass, make the score look good, make it look clean, criticize us for using key signatures, that kind of thing. And then um, we will go and create... Uh, basically a tempo map uh, for with MIDI that can be you know a, a click track and a mock-up of virtual instruments playing the parts so we have something to kind of fit ourselves into and then we'll each individually import all that stuff like we've tailored it to hit all of the the rubato the you know the slow ups and the speed ups and you know to make it feel expressionate and then we record our part and then everyone else records their parts. And ideally, as we go along, we're uploading 
the parts that are done. And when you sit down to record, you can pull the other people's parts in advance. So we're kind of getting to hear at least a couple other people and the expressions that they lay down. So I usually try to, and maybe this is a bit of first trumpet arrogance. I usually try to go and wait out there first and get my stuff done so that other people can listen to me and kind of play off of my expression. Uh, but other yeah, times it's, we'll get... it's like, he's the guy on YouTube. Sorry. He's the guy on YouTube. Who's writing first as a comment. That's John Robert. <laughs> <in our band. laughs> wow. I, I was going to say, I'm the guy that has to walk into the minefield first and find the plat, the, the path. Yeah. That doesn't blow up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, but yeah, so you, you go and I, you record the parts individually and then, uh, we sit down and, and usually what happens is then, because like Thomas said, he is the person that tends to do, the he he's our producer and has arguably like mastered the art of assembling a functional ensemble out of disparate pieces recorded in isolation. You know, we've all got pretty good setups for recording at this point uh, that are relatively dry, but he's also learned a lot of tips with, you know, a lot of little tricks with EQ and reverb to kind of bring everyone together into a nice homogenous sound. He'll import all that stuff on the other end, go through uh, and apply different levels of reverb to make us feel like we're in the same place, uh, do any kind of fine tuning with uh, pitch and timing. That's always one of the real challenges uh, is getting timing to be exact. We will do the best we possibly can, but at the end of the day, there's always a, a final pass with uh, a software called Melodyne, which is a plugin that allows for pitch and tempo modulation uh, and alteration without really affecting the, uh, the sound too much. And then you you're onto mixing and mastering and you're good. Uh, it's a process. It takes a lot longer, but the upsides of it are we can tackle some dangerous stuff. Sometimes some of our arrangements involve things that would be logistically difficult uh, or mechanically difficult, like going from one instrument to another instrument with not enough time to switch. You know, if you were to do it live, you would need to have some kind of a trade-off or changing mutes impossibly fast because brass instruments can have different mutes to change the sound. Um, but, you know, for the most part, we try to do stuff that is in fact playable. And, you know, and the nice thing also, like as a person who, <laughs> who, who is, uh, you know, like, I, 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 you know, a lot of us, you know, are not professional, professional players. Some of us are, and some of us do this a lot. Uh, but the nice thing about the way we do this is it gives you a little bit of a safety net. You can work your way through things, do like a bunch of takes and take the best version of that and roll that into the final uh, into the final uh, iteration. You know, there are way too many. <laughs> I probably shouldn't mention this. Okay. But there are a lot as, of as the person who gets to hear everybody's raw recording. Yeah, it <laughs> uh, does it. And so nobody else knows what it sounds like before it gets mixed. <laughs> um, if you are going to go out and do this and gather a bunch of people who live on different quarters of the continent, um, then, then you're going to have to use Melodyne. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's honestly, only... it's the thing that when you're in the same room with each other, there is so much that just good musicians listen and everybody just kind of lines things up. You don't even have to think about it being in an ensemble. I'll so I'll say the, I'll say the other thing that does help us sound more cohesive together that hasn't been mentioned yet is that even though we all have very different setups that are physically located in very different places, we all have very similar styles. So each of us records uh, using the mid side mic technique. We each have a large diaphragm condenser. That's the mid mic. And then a f something with the figure eight pattern that does the side. We all stand about the same distance away from the mic. We all record off axis with the exception of tuba. Um, so yeah, we, we've keeping had as a, many we've variables had like that. Make it sound consistent now. So yeah, so, you, but like you, keep keeping a lot of those variables the same helps us sound more cohesive. And then what's nice about mid side too, is that when it does go to Thomas, then he's able to go very precisely and, uh, position everyone accordingly yeah, yeah this, is, this is spread. this is our first album in a while that's just the quintet um and in fact our other ones were the first things that the quintet recorded so you could go listen to castles or stotopia and you'll probably hear a marked difference yeah. <laughs> from this yeah castles was like uh I think like timeline wise, the very first thing we ever started recording yeah. and like the what, like six that we finished. 
you know uh so like it's fourth, if i'm not mistaken yeah. fourth that we finished okay sorry it's yeah. been a little bit longer yeah. than a lot but uh but yeah we've been a band we've leased things for the last six years our first thing was august 2017 so we have a lot of practice throwing this stuff together now yeah wow definitely uh yeah lots of really good uh releases on your band camp folks if you're not familiar you should definitely head on over and check it out i, I just keep coming back to brassylvania it's such a good name oh man oh wow uh well I, I i feel like we're gonna dig into a lot more conversation about these songs as we continue so are we ready to get into our next listening block gentlemen 100 percent. 100 percent. cool uh this next song is one that I am familiar with. I have played this game. This is going to be Ruins from Undertale, as arranged by John Stacy and originally composed by, of course, Toby Fox. And then we'll be listening to Other Side from Minecraft, arranged by Daniel Romberger, and as originally composed by Lena Rain, a, a Vancouver local. Ha ha ha. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, John Stacy is obviously not here to discuss his track about ruins. Is there anybody else who wants to take up that mantle and share it with us a little bit of something to kick us off on this arrangement? Um, I think the, the funnest fact is this is the oldest arrangement the arrangement itself not the source material on the album this was written maybe four years ago three or four years ago before it finally got recorded wow otherwise it's a very john stacy piece <laughs> all right I'll, I'll listen closely and uh, and maybe you can point out to me what uh, what is john stacy about it um and then daniel uh, other side from minecraft anything you want to spoil us with uh, about this one uh, so this one has a very prominent drum set part, and I gave Rahul Vanamali very minimal instructions, and he absolutely nailed it out of the park. Right on. Okay. I well. didn't even I didn't even write a sheet for it. I just gave him very small instructions, and pretty much everything there was Rahul. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, uh, with that, folks, uh, let's listen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wow, absolutely lovely. Other side from Minecraft, and uh, and before that we had Ruins from Undertale. Um, yeah, Daniel, do you do you like Minecraft yourself? Do you play Minecraft? Uh, I'm gonna be honest, I actually don't. <laughs> I, I haven't played it. I don't have anything against it. Well, I do, but only sometimes. Uh, <laughs> so, you play it, or you have something against it? John, John Robert has that something against anime, but anyway, wait, wait, that has nothing to do with anything. Actually, just, actually, wow. just, I, yeah, I will claim fame, uh, a little self pat on the back here. I played Minecraft. I bought it when it was in beta, mm -hmm. like forever ago. Wow. Uh, and then Daniel Rosenfeld, who's like the original composer, C418, ended up moving to Toronto for a while, and I uh, got to hang him a bunch. So that was cool. Uh, obviously, he didn't compose this piece, but. Um, Yes, I have played Minecraft for a long time. I haven't played it recently, yeah. but that's that's lo the long time fan, first time caller. <laughs> the, the origin to why I decided to arrange this piece, though, was uh, usually whenever I'm working on something that's not music, I try to listen to new music whenever possible. So I was on Spotify and running through there, just like 
new songs that you might like algorithm. And then a couple times other side came on while I was listening to primarily not VGM, primarily just like chill music or J pop and stuff like that. And then other side came on a couple times and eventually I looked into it. It's like, wait, what is this song that keeps popping up? I really like this. And then I was very blown away that not only was it from a video game, but it was also by Lena rain. And I had known Lena rain's music through Celeste and through chicory. So I'm just like, wow, I really like this piece. I want to put this on the album. So, uh, yeah, that's how the arrangement came to be. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Awesome. And, and any special references or, or influences that you brought to this arrangement? Uh, well, I thought about doing a quote to the song Other Side by the Red Hot Chili Peppers, but I figured that was too obscure and like too out of character to be able to include it. Too niche. Um, <laughs> a lot of... A lot of the challenge that comes for me when it comes to arranging music for Brass Effect is figuring out how to take the original ensemble, especially if it's electronics related and video, like digital, and to be able to translate that into a classical brass quintet idiom. So oftentimes whenever I'm making changes, it's either in service of enhancing some quality of the original piece or making doing something that's like the original effect with the resources that we have available. And we knew that with this album, we wanted to focus primarily on quintet. So uh, the beginning, almost all of the parts that the different instruments played at the, in the beginning were somewhere in the original texture, but uh, I was kind of the one who was sorting out. It's like, okay, what do we do for this? Like, staggered entrance at the beginning how it just kind of fades in at the very end of the piece there's like this washing sound effect that overcomes everything as you kind of go beyond the other side so i had to make a couple of adjustments to figure out the brass quintet version of being able to do some of those things and then rahul as well uh, adding the percussion part adding the drum set to it really livened the piece up added so much more character than it was original and he put a lot of attention to detail into it he actually told me during our album reveal stream that he recorded the part twice the second time to match the syncopations the other instruments were doing better so uh shout outs to him for doing that <laughs> yeah definitely oh my god it's a lovely lovely arrangement um and obviously again john stacy isn't here to discuss his influence or the the lack of gameplay that he has towards undertale but i'm sure it's <laughs> I'm sure some of us in chat here can can speak to our love of Undertale a little bit. Uh, any of you guys want to take that bait? I mean, it's it's a very John Stacy arrangement. John likes very uh, muddy is the wrong word, but very dense very chords. Dense. He's, 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 he's all about like structures. yeah, yes. yeah, he, a brain, lot of that kind of brain motion jazz. in an brain jazz, <laughs> brain Horn jazz, jazz. Uh, yeah dense chords motion that doesn't necessarily follow in a way that you're expecting which can be you know it's a great effect of course and uh yeah there's a certain couple kind of chords that he gravitates toward that i don't have the theory chops to explain but he definitely uses them and uh yeah it definitely stays in that like horn range an interesting way that i think is really satisfying uh in the stream on like a couple days ago when the album first came out he was telling a story that wrote it was this one the one he wrote like in a hospital room? No, that was the other one. I think, yeah, but yeah, he wrote it in like 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. like just like while waiting for something to happen, or like just like waiting for someone to get out of the hospital. Waiting or something. something to like, yeah, so did this really? Yeah, waiting. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, really, yeah. And if you listen to his epic 11 minute uh, Metroid suite from our previous album, yeah, you'll get yeah. a lot more John mm -hmm. Stacy there too. It's it's just all iconically john stacy yeah <laughs> some very sophisticated very jazz influenced harmonies but also he really likes to play with interesting meters and rhythmic elements since so you have a lot of that kind of like two against three stuff going on triplets versus duplets versus quintuplets in the accompaniment uh breaking up the melody in weird ways that's like you know evolving it beyond what it originally sounds like it's not you know it doesn't flow quite the same but it flows in a new way and that's kind of cool so John Stacy, uh, yeah, I, I, I like certified genius. <laughs> I like actually he's soon to be a doctor. Um, I liked what Thomas said last time. You know, this this arrangement is easily the most interpretive 
of the original piece. Like it's the most removed in its own artistic way, which I think is again to great effect. You could even say to brass effect. Yes, you could, but that's not this album. So we wouldn't say that. (laughs) I have that shirt too. I'm not wearing it though. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh man. All right. Well, we're going to move on to our first group of three. We got a a real triple threat here. We've got hive Knight from hollow Knight, uh, arranged by Thomas and composed by Christopher Larkin. Um, we're going to be listening to cradle from spiral Knights. Uh, arranged by absent Alex Hill and composed by also absent uh, Harry Mack and um, and <laughs> the old ways from Pyre uh, arranged by one job John Robert Matz and composed by famous Darren Korb um, yeah uh, kicking things off here with Hive Knight Thomas this is your baby uh, what do you want to tell us about it what what's your baby called yeah I uh, played Hollow Knight for the first time maybe a year ago a year and a half two years ago not not fairly recently (laughs) um and and fell in love with it and just played through the whole thing Uh, spent spent weeks on it and um a lot of the music is uh very depressing (laughs) except for the except for like the battle themes um which are not depressing (laughs) uh and this this to me is like a more I don't I'm not gonna say it's obscure but it's like not one of the main tracks that I think a lot of people think of when they think of Hollow Knight, um, and it's I, there's there's always something going in my head when I'm trying to pick arrangements between do people know this track do I like this track um, I want to represent this game but where are the p- tracks people actually know um, I guess I assumed Hollow Knight was probably well known enough where I could pick something that wasn't the main theme or something like that. Um, And so we went with this. I think I just was felt, felt the, we'll say inspired. I don't like using that word, but we'll say I felt inspired one day and just got it done in an afternoon. Um, Short and sweet and kind of wrote itself. Right on. Yeah. I mean, sometimes that's all you need. Um, Alex Hill isn't here to speak about cradle. Um, But before we listen, anybody have anything that they want to mention about that one? We could always talk a little more after, of course, once we've heard the piece itself. Maybe we can identify things that are especially Alex Hill about it. Um, <laughs> well, then, John, why don't you uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the old ways before we listen here? Sure. Uh, so uh, I'm a big fan of Pyre. Uh, it's a weird game. It's probably. If I had to guess, I'd probably say it's Supergiant's like uh, least popular game, but also like uh, one of their biggest swings. Like they, 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 uh, you know, they start off with Bastion. Bastion is a solid, like revolutionary in the quality that they've got their uh, indie game with just a really fascinating like voice work and great music and good gameplay. They elevate it with Transistor. Uh, and then they've got this weird game, this game that is a like a strange psychedelic fantasy world with basically a visual novel attached to a fantasy hockey game, uh, inexplicably, uh, and with with a massively branching story and a billion other things. And the music is also super impressive like Darren just outdoes himself every time uh you know Hades is is fantastic you know the first game I think there's like what two songs that are really impactful he just the next one is about a singer and then this one has bards in it that tell stories as they go along and it's wild uh and I apologize to all Canadians uh but anyway um (laughs) about hockey anyway <laughs> um, but uh but I, you know i'm right anyway uh but it is this it is this fascinating game with this fascinating setting uh and i wanted to do something with the uh, the main theme and actually this is this is something that was released ages ago uh not on a not on a game brass album and we wanted to r- brush off the dust uh and make this uh and polish this up and make this something special for this uh and so i took it in a very slightly uh slightly unhinged because i'm unhinged as a human being uh slightly 
I want to say Baroque, but not actually in the musical term Baroque. Uh, excessive and weird 19th century stylings of of some of the like classic brass quintet writing. It is weird and strange uh, and hopefully relatively uh, uh, flashy and virtuosic at times. So I, I granted I gave myself a few flashy virtuosic things, but everyone gets a chance to show off in this sometimes more technical, sometimes more exaggerated and drunken. So I hope you enjoy it when we get to it. Absolutely. Well, let's uh, do our best to get to it then, folks. Uh, let's listen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wow, what glorious timing for a raid. Hey, what is going on, Swag Fam? Welcome, everybody, over to Bonus Stage. Thanks for coming here. Sweet Beegis, what's going on? Tell us what you guys were doing over on your channel. We here tonight on Bonus Stage are having a listening party for these four out of six gentlemen of the game Brass. And we are listening to their latest release, uh, the Brass Indie Expo. So we were just listening to... Um, the old ways from a game called Pyre. Uh, before that, we heard Cradles from Spiral Knights, and we had uh, the Hive Knight theme from Hollow Knight as well. Um, yeah, yeah, Thomas, uh, that Hive Knight theme. Um, I, there's something about the the battle music in Hollow Knight where everything's very, very triumphant. I think it lends itself well to a brass ensemble. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and. and did you? I'm sorry. I'm trying to remember. We've been having a lot of fun backstage, so it's hard to keep track of all the facts. Uh, but had you played Hollow Knight yourself? Yes. Yes. You. Yeah, I think yeah. you said you played it very intensely Fairly recently. And yeah. Right. Uh, and so, like, what 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 was like going up against the Hive Knight uh, battle? What was that like for you? Oh did, man! Did that I don't just know. like there's, grab there's you? Like, there's like 50 bosses in that game. <laughs> The four of them have their own track, and that was a good track. That's sometimes it's that simple. Amazing, I like it. Hey, tell me more how how you feel about this. I, it's just good music. It's man. just good. Wow. <laughs> I, sometimes that's all you need to say. Okay, well let's uh, let's just move on then. I guess no. Um, uh, yeah, Alex isn't here to talk about uh, Cradle, but uh, anybody else here played Spiral Knights? Know anything about that game? Anybody in chat has anybody played this MMO from like 2013? All right, cool. Um, we could just make stuff up. No, no one yeah, can we could. We could just. We just yeah. <laughs> we could, so, oh man! In the game it, Spiral Knights, you yeah, man, are cool. a knight who uses a spiral as a main uh, combat technique. Uh, you just like. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a spinoff of the classic uh, Gurren Lagann anime, and so the spiral. It's all. Never mind. Never mind. I'll stop. No oh. one. All right. Sorry, I, I I don't like anime. We're not really well equipped. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not equipped to uh, to to speak to Spiral Knights. Uh, Al played it, remembered it fondly. Uh, Aho Vanamali, one of our percussionist friends, uh, also played it and uh, remembers it fondly, and we had fun playing it. So that was great. Cool, and the music from it is lovely, and and also you yeah. played it and performed it, and it was a good job. Um. The old ways. This one's fun. I love. Uh, I love a good waltz. Uh, I love the the derpiness that is within. Um, yeah, and, and John. Um, yeah, it sounds like you're just a big super giant games fan. Obviously, Darren Corb is wrapped up in all of that. Um, yeah, tell me. Tell me about like your like how you came to love this piece and uh, and why you wanted to arrange it for the Brass Indie Expo. There were uh, there were a few different pieces that I had considered arranging from Pyre. Like Pyre itself is, I think, <sighs> the Hades score is also fantastic, but I think Pyre is a bit more interesting, if you will. Like it's got some very good songs. It's got some very weird sounds. Uh, it's got harpsichord in it, and I'm a sucker for harpsichord. I don't know what that says about me, but there you go. Um, <clears throat> but but for this one specifically, like this was the one that worked really well with this strange kind of mm, turn of the century, uh, like uh, disjointed janky waltz kind of vibe that I was twisting it into in my brain. You know, I was going for something that was like a, uh, a sort of a showpiece, but also like maybe it's a little bit inebriated. I'm not sure. Uh, and, uh, and really just kind of like leaning into like, like, uh flashiness but also some absolute nonsense i'm a big fan of a uh of a brass ensemble uh called nyozel brass uh they are uh they are out of austria mostly and it's a bunch of uh german speaking folks who are absolutely unhinged and i channel absolutely unhinged sometimes and this was that but incredible virtuosos like oh best absolutely. brass players on the kind, planet kind of the victor borga of brass Maybe. i would say i would say even stronger in the comedy they are they are if you ever get a chance to check out uh 
the Mnozil Brass, uh, M-N-O-Z-I-L. Uh, they are outstanding and absurd, uh, but like they sing, they weave quotes from one song into other things. They play their whole shows with choreography and like almost sketch comedy. They have like absolute nonsense going on all the time. And this is like way scaled back from that, uh, but definitely kind of channeling some of the same madness. Like there's, there's, you know, Danny has a solo in there that's uh, that's like marked molto slizando in the score. <laughs> this very sleazy, drunken solo, and like stuff like that. It's 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 unhinged and it's supposed to be unhinged. And hopefully, you know, and yes, maybe that's not quite appropriate for the relatively solemn nature of the old ways. Uh, it is original form, but I just had to have fun with it. I I do, I have a weird kind of. I'm, I'm digressing and taking more time here, but I have a weird kind of mentality about most of my arrangements where I try to take whatever it used to be and then remove it several degrees from the original. So I'll take a theme. This is the theme. How can I boil, the, boil this down and reinterpret it in some neat way and build it back up into something different? Uh, mm-hmm. I've been concerned about like, hey, I don't want to be like one-to-one. Here's just a transcription. The more I can change it, the less, the more I can bring of myself to it, you know, uh, rather than just orchestrating it or, or whatnot. Sometimes you want to stick closer to home, but in this case, it was a chance to flex and be weird. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and flex. I'll add that sort, that's sort of like an approach, you know, as a band, we take the music extremely seriously and we always try and do justice to what we're working with, whether it's, you know, Mario Galaxy or A Hat in Time. Um, but we take ourselves very not seriously. Uh, you know, we wear silly costumes and make funny videos and, and try to do an interesting, fun thing around this music that we actually adore. So, uh, that's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's great that you try to put into those arrangements and it really shows that like you care about the original work. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, you guys have put so much care into your arrangements, in fact, um, that uh, that you've started to start to sell uh, the arrangements themselves. Uh, you were talking about the Sleezando backstage, and I was like, well, who's going to appreciate that other than yourselves? And uh, and you made me aware to the fact that you are actually now selling sheet music on your band camp. Um, so, folks, if you yourselves want to be a game brass, you can do it, too. Uh, <laughs> Oh, and no, you can too. Oh and wait, uh, <laughs> I'm a game oh, brass, yeah. and you can too. Yeah. Uh, if it. you go to gamebrass.com, sorry, the gamebrass.bandcamp.com/slash/merch, you will see that we have started adding scores and parts for sale. Um, there are currently seven of them up right now, but there are more on the way. Um, some tracks from this album, some tracks from previous albums that are, are still in the works, and uh, it's something we've always wanted to do is since the beginning, and we've just sort of figured out the. I don't know if I should call it the legal side of it, but like the licensing and the being equitable side in a way yeah. that makes sense for everybody. The fact so, that this was uh, uh, having, oh sorry, no, uh, the fact that this was an indie album meant that, like we said back at the beginning, we actually know a bunch of these people, and uh, a lot of the times, like when you're working with indie developers and indie composers, they're a lot more amenable to letting you release stuff like this. So we worked out some deals and were able to like you know, offer some of this stuff uh, for people that are interested. Uh, we tend to get a lot of little messages from people asking for the sheet music for things. And most of the time, like there's no way to legally do that without us. There's no, now, unlike the normal licensing process for covers, there's no process for licensing sheet music. You have to work out an agreement specifically. So we're very fortunate that we were able to actually do a lot of the stuff from this album as sheet music. So you can check that out. You can pick it up. Uh, if you like, uh, on our, on our, the only, the only other thing I'll say about that is in most cases we, well, in all these cases, actually, we did do the legwork. We reached out to the original composers. We got the rights with them in mind. In many cases, we actually sent them the arrangements. We sent them the parts for free. So it was really, it was a really cool experience for us getting to hear feedback from 
the people that wrote the music that we're covering. Honestly, it was very uh, flattering experience in a lot of ways. And because we are doing these uh, licenses ourselves and distributing it on Bandcamp, which is notorious for taking a very small cut, um, that does mean that the majority of the revenue that is raised through sheet music sales goes to either us or to the original composer. And uh, that's something that is also pretty meaningful to us. <laughs> yeah. Don't know if you've ever ordered something from sheet music plus or music notes, but before, but they take a pretty steep cut. Mm. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And, and, you know, it does sound like all of these indie composers are a lot more accessible than having to go and, and knock on the, the giant gates at the Nintendo castle. And, uh, you oh know, yeah. And ask you to they, Miyamoto they, for they, do, they do not lower the drawbridge at Nintendo no. castle. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they no. The Mr. boiling Mr. oil. No, <laughs> Your sheet music is in a yeah. castle. <laughs> sorry, Mario. Reggie doesn't return our calls. Oh, Reggie. Can't imagine why. <laughs> Sorry, it is Bowser's Castle now. That's right. It's uh, true. We actually have to go it, to it Bowser's Doug Castle Bowser. specifically. Yeah. Oh, my God. I met Doug Bowser at the Seattle airport on the way home from a show one time. Anyway, he was really nice. Oh, okay. You have him a speed down now. You're BFF. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, then there we go. Robbie has already knocked on the gates, and he's uh, he's perfect. Met, Just like, hey, you remember gate. that time we met at the Seattle airport? Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> We want to yeah, yeah, Doug, Bowser, number, Doug yeah. Bowser's my uncle. He works. I got a yeah. spreadsheet of five hundred songs I want to license. <laughs> yeah, can we license uh, actually? Uh, no. Doug Bowser. Is Kirby music maybe? Uh... <laughs> I think that's oh. off the table, my friend. Oh my god. Well, I, I really think it is cool. Like you, you guys have put a lot of hard work into these arrangements and and into the engra- engraving, of course. And so to be able to share that with folks, I think that's uh, that's really neat and unique and valuable, and just shows a little extra depth and, and insight into the game brass. Um, well, we are just about at the halfway point of this lovely album that we've been enjoying so far. This gallery of gaming arrangements. Um, so we're going to continue on. We've got the Temple of Magics from Inscription, arranged by Daniel Rongberger and composed by Jonah Senzel. Um, and then the Dark Flute theme from Super Brothers, Sword and Sorcery. S- sorry, s- I'm, I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Sword and Sorcery uh, EP. <laughs> and that one is arranged by Robbie and composed by Jim Guthrie. Um, Daniel, uh, anything you want to preface the Temple of Magics with? Uh, nothing in particular. I'm down to let people hear <laughs> we'll, we'll deconstruct it afterwards absolutely uh a dark flute uh robbie um sword and sorcery uh, <laughs> what the heck is this uh is there anything that you want to spoil this arrangement with well yeah so it's a one of the first like ios game games like it's sort of an adventure game a couple action moments some puzzles but really big focus on the music and there's a cool like two sides of the record lp uh, motif that plays throughout the game, a lot of things to do with the moon phases. Um, but it was sort of one of the, the biggest indie games that kind of came onto my radar and sort of showed me that wave of how indie games was kind of coming into pop culture. Uh, so yeah, 2011 or so, 2010 maybe, uh, iOS game, Jim Guthrie, this was his break into uh, game music. And since then he's composed a ton of stuff. Yeah. So I really wanted to make sure to have Jim on this album and um sword and sorcery just felt like the right fit so right on well it's, with it's all dark of... dark dude for the dark flute. <laughs> dark dude for the dark flute oh god all right well we'll yep. hope to see lots of dudes in chat when that comes on uh folks let's listen Thank you. 
Man, we're we're having such a fun time here, folks. All the duding. Here. Thank you for participating in in slaughtering the word dude in chat, everybody. We're um, very serious. Yeah, we're very serious, and uh, and you should be too. Um, yeah, so that was Dark Dude. Oh, sorry. I mean that was Dark Flute uh, <laughs> from Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery. And before that, we heard the Temple of the Magic inscription. Um, Daniel, now that we've heard it, tell us a little bit more about your arrangement sure so uh jonah senzel did the music for all of the daniel mullins games so if, if you like inscription uh definitely check out pony island and the hex uh can't recommend it enough uh inscription is a roguelike deck builder that's one of my favorite genres it also has a, hor a horror theme and a lot of important story elements to it so uh that was one of those games as soon as i knew of its existence i got it like that minute basically it was so far up my alley um without giving away too much of the story i will say that the temple of magics is strongly associated with one particular minor character in the game this minor character has uh his defining characteristic as being very meticulous very uh forthcoming very pushy and determined and focused exclusively on what that character wants to accomplish to the extent that it actually can cause detriment to those around him. So when listening to the original theme and by Jonah Senzel, uh, it kind of reads almost like a theme and variation piece. It has this one melody that plays the same uh, it's played around by different instruments. It's tossed around a couple times, but it is in the same key. It doesn't really falter. It holds the line <laughs> the entire time, as you would say. So when I was arranging the piece, that was an element. That was a characteristic of it that was very important to me. There are only a very few times where I deviated from the original melody. Um, but uh, with the game, talking, about, talking again about arrangements... Uh, the composer has this array of all these electronic sounds that he's working with. Um, I have a palette that is comparatively more limited. Even though you can do a lot with five brass instruments, it's comparably not as much as the others. So I toss the melody around a couple times. Uh, I, I tried to generally follow the energy of the original arrangement. It's very intense in its contrasts between loud and quiet moments. In order to make the loud moments seem more loud, I added more attention. I added some harmonies, and uh, especially at the end, there's two very dissonant harmonies that play all at the same time in parallel. Super... Uh, caterwallic <laughs> effect really <laughs> emphasizing that you're pushing yourself to the point of pain and that's kind of what's happening uh if you think of it from a more narrative perspective um so yeah it's a it's a pretty intense piece it really spoke it really spoke to me and it really resonated with me as something that i could do a lot with with our ensemble so uh i hope you enjoyed that experience <laughs> <laughs> I did. I think I'm going to go back and, and enjoy that again. Um, you know, in the context of, of listening to this, but also going and playing the game, I too am 
a big fan of uh, of deck building roguelites. Um, uh, but speaking of of going to the point of pain, uh, that sounds like the job of a dark flute. And uh, and so we've got Robbie to speak on uh, on his arrangement there from Sword and Sorcery. Yeah, so I I knew that I wanted Jim to be on this album. Uh, Jim Guthrie is just such a staple of, or I should say, a pillar of the like Toronto video game music uh, existence. And so, um, having gotten the chance to to you know meet him, hang out with him, go to the studio, and sort of see some of his work. I just I knew that he was so iconic that I needed his piece, and what better way to do it than with you know the game that kicked it all off, and probably the one of the more memorable tracks from that that soundtrack. Um, so Dark Flute, I believe he told me was the first original track he wrote uh, on that soundtrack, and it sort of you know carries as being one of the the main things you hear a lot of the game. Um, but his work has never been adapted to an ensemble like ours before. So it's really interesting taking something that's like, uh, I don't know if I should be able to call this like an Alberti kind of line, you know, like that do, 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 do. No, so it's, it's classic yeah, it, it wing, totally right? Is like it's, it, it is an ostinato figure in an, the Alberti style. Yeah. Not, you know, you, you can't really just of... do that. Yeah. Uh, sorry, John. You can just do that, like on a. Bre- you could, but it's not going to sound right. If I just go like, do, 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 I'm not going to be able to, to jump those accurately and make it sound good. So I had to kind of throw the parts around to the different instruments and make. Yeah, you, know, you can't just Albertificationate it. Uh, <laughs> Albertify. Albertify. Um, yeah. Ah, boy. Albertify. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, so I had to throw some parts around, and then as the as I got through the arrangement a little bit more, uh, I, I basically did like a transcription originally, and I sent it to to the band, and they said, you know what, this is this is boring, Robbie, and they were right. Um, so I went in and started changing some things around. Um, I added a bunch of references to other tracks in the the soundtrack. Um, there's actually the the intro line that the French horn has at the beginning is from an entirely different track. It's the melody of a different uh, piece, um, which was the original piece that I was going to arrange for us, but it's too percussion heavy, so I, I skipped it. Uh, and then the trombone does a reference to the sound of the Sylvan Sprites doing their like, uh, uh, that happens a bunch later in the game when you're doing little sprite puzzles. Uh, but anyway, I uh, really wanted to make sure to have something like this on the on the soundtrack. The other one that I, since I have the chance to talk right now, uh, I almost, I nearly completed an arrangement of a Spelunky track, but we got too much to the end of the project and I, I had, to, had to scrap it, but uh, really wanted to get Spelunky in there too, maybe, maybe next time. Um, but really happy that I at least got my arrangement on this time. Absolutely. Uh, on on the subject of that arrangement and and doing and passing around the dutes, so to speak, uh, Thomas, I want to hear your take on what it was like to uh, to mix that in and to put that kind of in a in a stereo space and make sure that all the parts kind of came out with that intended texture. Um, we actually used a pretty much similar setup for every mix. Um, like the the goal is to more or less emulate a live ensemble and brass quintet kind of is a pretty standard group that's been around for a few a few decades so there's kind of a typical way they sit and so it usually would probably be up to the writer to think about that in advance um and i think we've definitely had other arrangements that have done stuff like that since trumpets traditionally actually sit in a quintet on opposite ends um so you kind of automatically get that stereo effect um I'm not sure that I'm always thinking about that when I mix, especially somebody else's arrangement, because um, I don't know the, the music as well, and I'm throwing the tracks in and trying to get it done. But um, there's there's always like a challenge to just balance things like that inherently when, when mixing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was definitely something that I had designed in how I wanted the the things to be thrown around a bunch. Nice, just like oh, first trumpets over there, second trumpets over here. We're just gonna. We're just going to pass the dudes. I mean, there's times when we do things that are like in the studio where it's an effect you could only emulate Mm -hmm. in this way. You can't do live. But like the the advantage we have in writing is that we're writing for a standard ensemble that we know how it's going to be seated in the mix already. And we even know who's playing the part. So everything's kind of written. Yeah. The mix process is, 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 uh, is more just a matter of, 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 
turning knobs till it sounds like everybody's sitting together rather than like uh, a creative process and in, in putting that together the, the rangers hopefully already kind of thought about that who's playing what and yeah how that would case, sort of translate in mm-hmm. this case it's like you know we have like these you know the, the term we're looking for is antiphonal you know where you have like now, uh instruments who's looking for that term <laughs> We get, we get our classical music terms quota for the night. Yeah, come on. Yeah, I'm, yeah, afraid, I'm afraid the audience is yeah, wrong. But, you know, pa- passing those da, 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 back and forth, you know, across the stereo space. You know, antiphonal uh, writing, very popular in like St. Mark's Cathedral in, uh, you know, uh, in, in in Venice, you know, like lots of, uh, you know, Gabrielli. Uh, right yes, of Brad. course, relatable content. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, really, yeah. We're here for the most relatable content. Come on. I'll have a music history stream one day. All right, Actually, let's go. Yeah, abs- ab- absolutely. Please do that. You heard it here first, folks. Um, yeah, music history and uh, and and uh, <laughs> what's the word I'm looking for? Um, esoteric uh, names <laughs> and words in classical arranging. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, well, getting back towards uh, music that doesn't have any words in it, uh, we're going to listen to <laughs> some more songs. By the game brass here. Uh, speaking of roguelike deck builders, uh, a, a arrangement from Slay the Spire, of course, arranged by Daniel Romberger, uh, composed originally by Clark Aboud. Um, the the Guardian emerges. Act One boss. Oh, I love I love the Slay the Spire soundtrack. I've played that game to hell. Um, mm. And we're going to be following that with Little Shibuya from Super Crush KO, also arranged by Daniel. This this entire block is just arranged by Daniel Romberger, folks. Um, uh, and this was actually yeah, composed yeah. by Robbie Duguay, uh, which is amazing. I can't wait to hear both of your takes on that. Um, and then to finish off that, this upcoming block, we've got, of course, from Cuphead, Funfair Fever, um, composed by Christopher Madigan. Um, yeah, folks, I, I'm just keen to get into this juicy block of music. So let's break it down on the other side and uh, let's listen. Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, God, I love the athletic theme for Mario. I mean the fun pair of theater <laughs> theme from Cuphead, of course. Uh, yeah, that arrangement by Daniel Romberger, composed by Christopher Madigan. Um, yeah, before that, we had Little Shibuya from Super Crush KO. And then the before that, even we had Slay the Spires, The Guardian Emerges, uh, the Act 1 boss theme, of course. Uh, so why don't we start there, Daniel? Um, uh, you expressed your love already for roguelite deck building games um mm-hmm. yeah so uh me and my partner we played slay the spire like we did the daily challenges for like i think a solid year um very much love that game very much love the music from it uh so i can understand how playing that game would drive you to make something for uh for a brass ensemble i think it's just a perfect fit yeah it it really worked very well um so that arrangement, I don't even know if I told the rest of the band this, but originally I had wrote that for me, uh, playing uh, five trombones and two euphoniums. At the uh, same so time. Sorry. Yeah, at the same time. <laughs> multi-tracked. Find all of your orifices. Multi, <laughs> multi-tracked. Um, and then when uh, the idea for this album came around, then I readapted it for the game brass. I actually changed quite a lot of things in order to, about the arrangement in order to make that work. Uh, both there being two fewer voices. And also I wanted to add percussion elements because percussion, uh, really adds a bit of extra power to the ensemble. Um, the theme itself is, quotes a little bit of there's an event called mind bloom that you get in act three where you have to one of the options that you have is to play against a boss that you would normally see in act one and it's just like this really small one-time event that may or may not even happen and if it does happen then you may or may not pick that option though you usually do uh but there's a custom theme set for mind bloom as well and it references the original uh battle theme in a pretty interesting way so uh for this particular arrangement i included a couple elements that are found in the mind bloom variation of the track as well nice love that deep cut oh my god i would not have noticed i honestly and and i've I've come up to that event and been like yes of course i'm gonna just just stomp this act one boss Um, it makes you feel good like knowing how far your deck has come since then yeah yeah (laughs) it's, it's it's absolutely awesome um, and then after that, we had uh, Super Crush KO composed by Robbie Duguay. Oh my god, folks, we've got the composer here in chat. Everybody, claps. I Let, know let's him. see those cheers. Ah. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so you composed this music, Robbie, or did you? Sorry, yes. are you gonna you <laughs> cut me off? Did you? <laughs> it sounded like you were gonna cut I me did. off and be like, oh, No, it's not me, it's I was a different say... Robbie Duguay. <laughs> no, there's only one of me. There is a Rob Duguay who is a radio host in Maine, Bo- Boston, Massachusetts, Maine, New England. Uh, and there is a there is another Rob Duguay or Robbie with an IE who is a jazz bassist. If you can believe that, you probably can. Uh, but anyway, no, I am the composer of Super Crush KO. Uh, it was my third or fourth game with um, Vertex Pop that did that the game came out in very very early 2020 i want to say january and uh daniel was uh kind enough to uh do an arrangement of little shibuya and actually the fossil hunters main theme as a birthday gift to me um so just like a really sweet gesture to to throw those together and when we started the album i said hey guys i got this arrangement that daniel did like what do you think and everyone was really positive and on board and so we, we threw it on the album nice Oh, well, well, that that was yeah. like much sweeter. I, I was kind of like going to ask like, oh, what, Robbie, you were like too good to arrange your own song for the album. Or, <laughs> <laughs> but the fact Not that good enough, like, more like, oh, we, snap. I, yeah, I don't think I don't think we would ever want to arrange our own music for ourselves. We would like I think almost every one of us like would want to get one of the other ones to to arrange our thing. Like, I don't know, like that yeah, just feels it right. Feel it makes fresh. it more interesting that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I don't want to, I don't want to reinterpret my music for game whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, and, and secret behind the scenes info here: we, we had things and also very much joked about the Mega Math medley, uh, the entire album production. Uh, 
the John's music should actually be on this album. I'll say that. Like we we should have figured out some way to get it on there. Um, he's definitely a, a more prolific composer than myself. But uh, getting like a little clip from Chia, a little clip from you know Fossil Echo, a little clip from For the King, throwing them all into the Mega Mats medley just is a, such a fun idea. To you me. just wanted to call it the Mega Mats medley, didn't you? That was I really, really like saying yeah. Mega. It, it does medley. sound very good. Triple yeah. M. Oh yeah, gotta love the yeah. alliteration. This uh, world mm-hmm. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah, I, I cannot wait to hear that whenever it may happen. Um, yeah, and then after that, of course, uh, Cuphead. Funfair Fever, not to be confused with um, with any of Koji Kondo's work. Um, <laughs> Daniel, uh, yeah, how did you avoid confusing this with Koji Kondo's work? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's it's only the one part that kind of resembles it, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> no, Funfair, Funfair Fever is great. I actually had arranged it previously, uh, both for myself uh whistling plus david russell playing piano and then another time in mario paint composer uh on my personal channel danny music which i update like every now and then nowadays but uh funfair fever the mario paint composer version is my most viewed video by far and i think it's just because it happens to have mario in the title because of mario paint and that's the one that everyone calls the mario world athletic theme so (laughs) Mario, Mario, he's a plumber. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but Luigi Mario, 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 Mario. This is my brother, Luigi Mario. <clears throat> it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. So this one, this one was much more adapted than those ones were in order to suit our ensemble. Uh, a lot of the piano part in particular has constant 16th notes. So I had to find ways to break that up among the instruments that were at our disposal and there were a couple other parts that I felt that even if you could do them, then they wouldn't really sound great because they're not idiomatic on brass instruments. So I tried to come up with ways to get the same effect with uh, skills that were at our disposal. In many cases, this involved adding counter melodies, adding like different tuba runs, things like that. There's a part where the tuba actually quotes uh, Entry of the Gladiators by Fushik. Uh, also known as the circus theme uh, in the bass as very shortly before the climax of the piece. The climax of the piece is in swing time, which is a difference. So uh, really wanted to emphasize just being goofy and having fun, even though the piece is really quite hard. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, man. Well, we definitely had a lot of fun listening to it. I hope it was actually fun to play after all of that. Um, yeah, we've just got a couple more listening blocks, folks. Coming up next, we've got an arrangement by Thomas Kresge, uh, composed by Daisuke Amaya, and that is, of course, the Moon Song theme from Cave Story. I love Cave Story. I just beat it recently again, and it's just such a wonderful game. The first um, indie game of all time. The first indie game, yes. The very first. Oh, my God. Um, and then after that, we've got an arrangement by John Robert Motts, uh, composed by Lucas Pope. It is The Doom from Return of the Obra Dinn, and I am definitely going to need uh, a frame of reference as to what the heck that is. Um, John, do you want to... You wanna... You've never heard of, of Return, Re- of, the Return of the Obra Dinn? No, I haven't. Oh, have you heard of Papers, Please? Papers, Please, yes. Okay, so Papers, Please was Lucas Pope's like breakout game. Uh, his next game, which is, I think, even better, is <clears throat> a detective thriller... Uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, uh, called Return of the Oberdin. And in Return of the Oberdin, you play an insurance investigator working for the East India Trading Company. And the year is like 1886 or something like that. Uh, and you are rowed aboard the Oberdin, a merchantman that has returned without its crew. And you have to figure out what happened to every single person on the ship. You are given a log and a manifest and a stopwatch that lets you, or I should say a pocket watch that allows you to stop time and return to the moment that a person expired. So you find the bodies of various people and pull out the pocket watch and descend into 
a freeze frame walk around into frozen time. You hear an audio play of their last moments. And then at the moment the killing blow is struck, boom, the world explodes into a freeze frame in 3D uh, that you can walk around and see what happened and try to figure out who the people are, who killed them, why did they kill them, how did they kill them? <laughs> and furthermore, like... Every, every, what's going on with everyone else in the scene. Uh, and it is all in a kind of monochrome, one-bit Macintosh-looking, mm. uh, uh, like, retro 3D art style that looks like the kind of thing that would be rendered in, like, 1992 when you were at the library learning to use a computer for the first time, <sighs> except it's in 3D, uh, with just, like, really very effective voice acting, very good sound work, and then these tableaus, basically, that you walk around. And sometimes there are there are, are clues or other deaths within the tableau that you can enter. So you can go into a world within a world within a world oh, and try that's to it's, it, yeah. it's amazing. Like really like I'm a huge fan of mysteries, uh, mystery like, you know, books and literature. I like solving puzzles like this that are well, like well thought out all the way through. And this game is one of the great. Like, Phoenix Wright, great game, really like a wonderful detective game. Uh, this is that cranked up even more intensely. Uh, and the music is all composed by Lucas Pope, uh, the designer of the game, writer of the game. It's very much a kind of one man show. It's him and like two other people and the rather, I think it's like maybe like, I think they have a unique voice actors for every single character. Wow. Uh, and they all ha speak in like they're it's a very multicultural crew. So they speak different languages. And some of the puzzles are like you hear their voice. Who's talking? It sounds like it's Swedish. OK, there are two Swedes on the ship, that kind of thing. And so like it's a, like voice cast is pretty big. But the crew of the actually built the game very small and the music is intense. So you'll hear that when uh, you get there. Uh, <laughs> if you've seen if you played over Din, you will recognize this music because it hits early. Uh, and uh, I strongly recommend you check it out if you have not played over Din. Anyhow, there we go. Sweet. All right. I am, I'm going to consume that game. That sounds absolutely lovely. But first, I'm going to listen to music from it. And you are all going to listen to music from it. We're going to be hearing Moon Song, Moon Song, Moon Song from Cave Story, mm -hmm. and then The Doom uh, from Return of the Over Din. Folks, let's listen. <laughs>
Oh, yes. All the Invaders in fans in chat. Doom to doom doom. Dooms in chat. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. That was that was lovely. You got to have a little bit of doom in there. Um, you, do, 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 do. Sorry, I'm thinking of the game now, of course. Um, yes. Yeah, so that was arranged by John Robert Motz, uh, composed by Lucas Pope. The Doom from Return of the Oberdin, which all of us have now heard about. Um, and before that, we had Moonsong from Cave Story, as arranged by Thomas Kresge and composed by Daisuke Amaya. Uh, Thomas, why don't you start off here and uh, and tell us a little bit about your arrangement of Cave Story. And, and if you're experienced with playing that game as well, anything that might mean something to you. Um. So, Cave Story, I also haven't played. Okay, fair, that's fine. But, <laughs> hold on. Okay, Cave Story, I also haven't played, but I had heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I with, with every album, I feel like there's a list of things that come to mind where if somebody says indie games, you're going to think of a few things, like Undertale. Um, and I said, for me, I think Cave Story still, even though I haven't played it, Feel like it still feels like a definitive indie game and like a lot of these things i'd heard the music before so mm -hmm. um had already you know was familiar with that as something i wanted to to work with so this was one of those uh shoe-ins that we that we get yeah in my opinion i mean if you had a, an entire gallery of uh of game music that you wanted to present and you Labeled it indie, like yeah. How could you? How could you leave Cave Story out of there? Definitely, cool. Um, anything special you want to add about your style or your approach to arranging Moon Song specifically? Um, there's always a on, on these arrangements. There's a, or my approach personally is that I want something to still feel like it's the. A definitive concert version of this music so it sounds like this is if this was for brass quintet from the start what would it sound like um that's usually my approach for a lot of these and so it leads to you know some level of variation on it developing the music in some way um and this this was a harder one i think to work out in the end uh if I remember correctly, it took me a little while to, to finish this and figure out exactly what to do with it. But we got a couple different sections out of it. Um, and I also want to shout out again, Doug Perry and Raul Vanamali, who are playing percussion on that track as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They did an awesome job. We also had... Uh... Yeah, we should mention Doug's... Sorry, we should mention Doug's oh, yeah. chimes. So Doug has some uh, repurposed, recycled chimes from like old church organ i believe yeah. is a story yeah. oh wow and He's so they're got... not the size that normal percussion tubular bells are they're like much bigger um and we actually we had the pleasure of sorry 
they're more apocalyptic that way. They're more apocalyptic. Yeah, so it really works with uh, with the Doom. Um, we have the pleasure of having Doug and also Rahul join us for our main stage uh, MAGFest performance this past year. And, uh, you know, since Doug's chimes are so big and bulky and hard to carry around, we were like, hey, like, would you want to play chimes in our thing? And he's like, I'm bringing like one or two maximum. So uh, into our arrangements, we figured out a couple places to just put like one chime. And so shout out to F chime. Love me some F chime. MVP. Nice. Well, I bet Doug's D chime was going to be a little bit too big. <laughs> Sorry. Wow. All right. Um, John. On the stage after dark. <laughs> yeah. Hi. John, do you want to you save us here from the depths, from the abyss, and tell oh. us a little bit about your arrangement here? Sure. Uh, so the Doom... Uh, the doom happens. Uh, this kicks in like one of the, mm, I think like the third uh, or so time you dip into the past and look at the fate of something. Uh, and it is beautifully horrifying. Uh, and just this wall of sound like Luke's Pope tends to like, if, you, if there is, there is a rawness and a viscerality, uh, unabashed, like in your faceness to the music that he's written. Uh, and it also is very short and simple. Because basically you get, uh, like, every track of music play, you know, plays for the length of time that you have in the past, and then it ends. And then you get sucked back to the present. You only have so much time to look around. And it's a little short, honestly, for a piece of music to stand on. So I took us off in our own kind of direction. Also, like, the music, it's just like kind of a, uh, a mishmash of a few different elements that have been rearranged to give us a little bit more of an arc. So we start off with these wall of sound chords, and then we move to this lighter thing, and then we move back to the wall of sound stuff. And usually in the game, you start with the, the lighter stuff, maybe, and then we hit the wall of sound to end it, because you know time is running out. But I like the, the impact of kind of shuffling those elements around uh, to give us a bit more of a... Uh, yeah. Robbie, were you about to say something? Uh, I don't know if it's just me. I'm having a hard time hearing you, John. Oh, no. A little bit, a little, oh, no. little, little bit of yeah, just some microphone artifacting or something. Why? I'm Why? so sorry. Yeah, you went like you went like loud and then quiet and loud and quiet. I heard basically everything you said, but I was trying to interrupt you to be like, "Hey, lean into it or something." I don't know. Sorry, I guess uh, my computer's getting tired. Uh, we'll fix it in post. <laughs> yeah, we'll fix. It. We say that there is no post, but anyway. Uh, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, basically, just like uh, the gist of the, what I rambled about was that you know i reorganized the structure of his music a bit and elaborated on some ideas changed some things up um and uh and halfway through i realized like there's no chime in the original but boy did it feel right to have uh and because of the weird nature of doug's chimes they just ring for 20 years straight and we took advantage of that at the end to let it ring forever and like try to find a tasteful time to let it fade out. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, uh, but yeah, go play Return of the Oberdin when you get a chance. No spoilers. Oh man, I go, I do love a good murder mystery as well. That's gonna that's really. Oh gonna... boy, buddy, buddy, <laughs> there are so much, so many. Uh, oh, yeah. I, won't I, I will report back. You and I will have a conversation about it after I played for sure. Excellent. Oh man. Uh, coming up on our final listening block and two games that I have also not played. Um, Pizza Tower. It's pizza time. Uh, as arranged by Daniel Romberger, originally composed by Mr. Sauce Man. Um, and then the final track on this album, uh, uh, The Bard, Wander Song, also arranged by Daniel and originally composed by Gord McGlattery. Um, yeah, uh, thoughts, uh, anyone on this, on, on the chat here can, can pick this up. Uh, anybody here played Pizza Tower and or Wander Song? Uh, let me know your experiences. I mean, John Roberts literally on Wander Song. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the he's voice of the main character in the game. True, yeah, I, I'm, uh, I play the bard in Wander Song. Oh. Uh, so when you go play that game, you control me. Uh, you control my voice. You make me sing. Uh, using your uh, your analog stick, 
Uh, so uh, that is a thing you can do. That was a really lovely game to be a part of. It's this incredibly charming, colorful game about uh, a small bard who's trying to save the world through uh, basically uh, through song and caring and helping people. And, uh, uh, you know, and he's not the hero with the magic sword that can save the world, but uh, that's, uh, or they, they are not the hero with the magic sword that can save the world, but it is a, uh, a really touching game with some really lovely stuff and it's cool. Uh, highly recommend it. It's got good music. Uh, and I think you'll like that track when we get there, but first absolute pizza madness. Tower. Yeah. We had a, we had a like uh, game grooves on for their pizza tower um, album. And, uh, mm. and I think there was only like one or two people on that album who had played pizza tower. So my standards are pretty low. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anybody here with experience on Pizza Tower? <laughs> oh, okay. I can I can talk about that. So I think more than any other game in recent history, especially for an indie game, Pizza Tower really owns their style. Like everything is a caricature, over the top. There's like ev- the movement is extremely fast to the point that it's difficult to manage. You're going so fast. Uh, <laughs> The, there's like a window where you can see a frame of the main character looking at what's happening visually and like constantly making expressions throughout that. Literally every single enemy, literally every single major feature has something to do with pizza or the ingredients that make pizza. And the theme that happens uh, for It's Pizza Time is at the very end of each stage, you destroy a pillar and you have to go back to the beginning of the stage while there's a time limit going on. If the time limit goes down to zero, then you get chased by a giant pizza who eats you. (laughs) So. Wow. You just very, very over the top, bizarre trip of a game. It takes a lot of inspiration from Wario land Four, especially. Right. And I try to channel a lot of that massively chaotic energy into this arrangement as well. Wow. Sorry. When you said that there's a timer and, uh, and then the pizza eats you, you just like re- you took me right back to ski free and I am oh, probably yeah. <laughs> dating myself. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I know ski free. <laughs> I love ski free. <laughs> it's a shame that game doesn't have any music. That's uh, mm. Oh man. <clears throat> I want to see more representation for that. All right, folks. Well, uh, we're going to get into It's Pizza Time and The Bard. So, uh, yeah, let's listen. Hello there. Hello there. Hello there. there. Thank you. 
Wow, yeah, that was a that was a great denouement. Um, <laughs> we're just loving our words here today for for a whole bunch of songs that don't have any words in them. Um, yeah, that was the Bard from Wander Song, and you heard the voice of John Robert Motts himself there. Um, and before that, we had a very wacky "It's Pizza Time" arrangement. Oh man, uh, definitely breaking the mold from the brass ensemble there lots of uh lots of other instrumentations uh some extended techniques definitely very unusual um you know daniel you obviously had a lot of unusual source material to draw from but uh but how did this all come together for you for this arrangement yeah like i said i really wanted to challenge channel the kind of creative energy the chaotic energy that goes into the original soundtrack so a lot of that did involve like using brass instruments the way that they aren't meant to be used with the key clicks and everything uh there's a part where i recite a pizza recipe in the middle and it's distorted so you can't really hear anything uh um, there's a part where John Robert just screams and it goes from one ear to the other. Uh, so really trying, really trying to like kind of play up on those things. I think uh, the most extended of these jokes is uh, about midway through the about midway through the piece. There's a very abrupt tonal shift into a 16th century a 16th century counterpoint texture and. Uh, that entire thing was basically stemmed from one reference in the original where there's a random voice clip of someone saying, you all ready to get funky? So I'm like, Hmm, you all ready to get funky, but we're not, we're not exactly, we're the game brass. We're not exactly funky. So then what is the game brass? Well, the game brass can just do counterpoint. So what if I just like took this and then actually did like this, 16th century counterpoint and it goes on for like a minute uh in the middle of the piece completely interrupting everything uh it's so like pretentious <laughs> at least serious <laughs> in a way that uh it's the humor is being uh pretentiously over the top and serious about it and uh then it goes away just as abruptly as it had come with everyone saying hurry up and then it's back to the original texture um those lines at the beginning too, uh, everyone saying hello there. I really had to think about how I wanted to replicate that effect in the original track. There's one sample of someone saying hello there, and then it gets repeated a couple times and slowed down. So it creates this distortion effect. Uh, so for us, I had everyone sing it, try to match roughly the same interval tone, but start at different ranges. So I actually had the lowest hello there. I think it went down to the low D, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's, so that's kind of the idea. I really wanted to channel just what makes pizza time 
and Pizza Tower in general, very in your face, chaotic, energetic, and fun. Also, shout outs to Rahul Vanamali for playing the drum set on that part. Uh, it was actually quite fast and quite challenging, and he did a really good job with it. <laughs> and shout outs for yourself as well for throwing some theremin on there. True. I. Yeah, also with the theremin, too. This is the first time that I actually distorted theremin in a Game Brass recording. And I just recorded it after the fact and added a few effects like you would get from pedals to really just play with the sound and make it add a little bit of that extra bizarre, otherworldly spice to it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I cannot wait to see it replicated in a live setting. Um, <laughs> just hey, sure that's you, a challenge. Your trombone and your theremin, if you could play... The theremin with the end of your trombone. <laughs> yeah, so that is that is a challenge. Thunder, um, yeah. I believe there are currently seven pieces from this album that have sheet music available, and it's pizza time is one of them. Uh, with that, we actually have two versions of it's pizza time. There's one that's pretty much exactly what we had played to record this piece. So if you wanted to study the score or you wanted to try playing along, then you have the option to do that one. But then. Uh, also included with the same uh, purchase, if you get it on Bandcamp, uh, you can get a performance version where we did take the piece and simplified it a little bit. It's in a slightly lower key, and uh, we did a couple of different alterations to get some of the effects. Uh, like Thomas had certain members start from off stage in order to replicate the coming in gradually effect. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if there are any if there are any esoteric contemporary ensembles out there that want to try it, I would love to hear it. If you know someone who happens to be in an eccentric contemporary brass quintet and wants a challenge, then this is something that you can provide them. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, well you guys are the only one that comes to mind. Um, but if any other come up, I'll definitely throw them your way. <laughs> oh man, and then after that we had, of course, the Bard from Wander Song. So Daniel, did you arrange this for John Robert Matz's birthday? No, <laughs> not for his birthday. <laughs> yeah. Close enough, um, though. But but this was... this was a really this was a really special thing for us because like John Robert Matz is the voice of the Bard, which is like. I, the mechanic of Wonder Wander Song. Wander Song would not be Wander Song without John Roberts' voice. It is ingrained into every element of the game design. So I really wanted to give John Robert that special moment. And as we talked about before, Wander Song is very much about of like uh not necessarily the mightiest hero at first glance, overcoming all the challenges that are set in his way with set in their way with uh kindness and love and with song so it's incredibly wholesome game like, it's, it's very really it's very charming in a lot of different ways so to add to that effect i added a percussion section no drum set in that one it's all more auxiliary uh yeah auxiliary instruments a couple toys and things like that mm. and all of those other instruments are played by members of the game brass ensemble <laughs> <laughs> oh my god one of the fun bits about that is, you know, all of the lyrics that are written are are all of the all of the stuff you said before, like you can play the bard's part in the game if you wanted yeah. to. Um, but when it uses you, the exact range that the bard has in can game. sing. Yeah. When you gave it to me, though, there were no lyrics. And so I went back to our uh, I dug up the old Excel spreadsheet from. 2017, 2018 or so when I recorded all that stuff and all of the syllabic combinations for every uh, line and basically just like, okay, we got to come up with authentic lyrics that were sung in the game because the way we did it in the game was, you know, a a syllable and a held no, starting consonant and a held vowel shape for as long as you possibly can so they could turn it into a loop. Uh, and so I went back and went back to that list and figured out what lyrics sounded good. It's all nonsense, of course, but I wanted to do something that had like a sense of, you know, rhyme and that had like good vowels to live on for the long notes and, and whatnot. And then just tried to put on my, my bard hat again. Wait, I got, I got that over there. Uh, put on my bard hat again and, uh, and really kind of like lean into the bard sound, uh, which I haven't done in a while. Oh man. What was it like to relive that character? I mean, it's it's it is. I mean, it's 
it's interesting because like this is one of these things where like the way that I might I contributed to the game was uh, originally was like I there's no dialogue in the game that's voiced, but there are some like verbal exclamations and things like that. And I did a few things, uh, and I think most of the other ones were actually done by M Haberstadt, who is uh, one of the uh, one of the like audio leads over at A Shell in the Pit, uh, also in Vancouver. Hmm. Uh, you know, but uh, but then uh, everything else is like basically just creating this virtual instrument uh, that you're going to control using, you know, your Xbox 360 controller or whatnot. Uh, and so you're just singing notes to some degree. And I didn't really know much about it beyond the basic setup for the game, which I really liked. But, you know, you had uh, but I think I made like, you know, two octaves of normal stuff. And then there was also like a version where I was singing very boldly and then a version where I was like very scared and a version where I was like depressed and trying to make like create a virtual instrument where you're singing, but you're depressed is really weird instruction and very challenging to try to do. It's like, um, it's, it like I'm really this feels like feels easy, man. I don't know. <laughs> But then it's just a dial on the on the yeah just for that, just right? yeah. yeah yeah well I mean it, it, actually like that's a spoilers for the game like you aren't all in one emotional state over the course of the game and things happen the game as much as like as as much as I like harped on about it being like this wholesome experience boy it goes places and there was a point at which it just hit very it was laser targeted and it was kind of worse because I was the <laughs> character and i had to step away for a bit uh so uh it's a great game highly recommend you check out wander song it's uh, been out for a few years but it's on like everything at this point so um it's a good game nice well i think that i can safely recommend that everybody goes and checks out the brass indie expo what a wonderful gallery of gaming arrangements that we've been able to listen to tonight and that you can all listen to on your preferred devices in your own time by heading on over to the Bandcamp page and purchasing it. We did just miss a Bandcamp Friday, but uh, but you know what? You don't have to wait until the next one. You can go there right now and grab it. Uh, there is also a compact disc available for purchase and, uh, and a couple other purchases as well. Um, so definitely go and find something that you like over there. Uh, excellent job, everybody. Uh, Robert, uh, sorry, Robert, John, Robert, Knotts, yes. Thomas Kresge, Daniel <laughs> Romberger, Robbie Duguay, and of course, John Stacy and Alex Hill, who are not here. And also Rahul Vanamali and Doug Perry. Um, all excellent work on this album. This is uh, just an absolutely beautiful release. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I usually wrap things up here by asking what's coming up next. So, yeah, anything in the works for the Game Brass? Are you guys going to sit on your laurels for a little bit? We do have more things coming up. But oh, yeah. they're not official yet. But we are releasing new sheet music within the week. Yep. yep. And hopefully later. So and, keep looking out for that. Yeah. Mm. And uh, our our YouTube channel is going to be filled with more videos from this album. We always try to like, yeah, you know, we always start off with a simple achievable idea and then go way too hard on it <laughs> uh, because we can't help ourselves. So please come watch those. We always try to do a premiere. The premieres are Sundays. Uh, and, uh, they are just, you know, it's always just a fun little time. Uh, feel free to, to drop in, see what nonsense we have wrought for that week. Uh, it's always good. Um, yeah, it's, it's usually every two weeks and we just did one this last Sunday. So expect one in about a week and a half Sunday at one Eastern on our YouTube channel. Okay, cool. Well, that's a nice way to start your Sunday morning over here on the West coast. Folks, definitely go and hit that subscribe button and purchase the Game Brass. Uh, this album is also expected to arrive on other streaming platforms at a later date, as of yet unannounced, uh, but definitely look for it on your preferred streaming platforms. Um, and thank you, everybody in chat, for being here and for participating and for sharing your lovely thoughts and your esoteric words. Um, it's been a really good time here on Let's Listen tonight. Thank you so much, the Game Brass. Uh, we're going to close things up here. I might find a worthy raid target, but uh, but otherwise, folks, you can expect to see more here on Bonus Stage. Um, next weekend on Saturday the 16th, we will be having our next music online concert. Uh, so definitely go and check our social media for updates on that. And otherwise, we'll see you around. Thanks, everybody.
Have a good night. Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.